Today we are going to be looking at the very beginning of Matthew's Gospel. It's one of these fun passages with lots of uh, exciting names to read. Uh, before we read it, why don't we open with prayer? Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, and we thank you that uh, you considered us worthy enough to enter into history, to become human even as we are, that we might share in your destiny. We thank you for this season, and we remember, <clears throat> we lift up this time this morning, and we invite your presence. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds, that we might see you better, and become more like you. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. amen. All right, Matthew 1, 1 through 17. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. <clears throat> Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Solomon. Solomon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amon, and Amon the father of Josiah. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abihud, and Abihud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eli. Eliud was the father of Eliezer, Eliezer the father of Matan, Matan the father of Jacob, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. <coughs> <coughs> yes. Outside of the Bible. Um, really? we, we have records of some of these kings. Okay. Um, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> because there, there are some curious features of this genealogy, uh, to say the least. Um, first, it's worth noting that the first two words in Greek, uh, which are translated the record of the genealogy of, uh, literally the book of Genesis, <laughs> so the book of Genesis of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, uh, which harkens back, of course, to the other beginning um, in Scripture, the original beginning. Uh, Matthew is the only one who begins his gospel with a genealogy. Uh, do you know where Mark begins? With John the Baptist crying in the wilderness, there's no birth story in Mark. Um, there isn't one. Well, John begins where? In the beginning. In the so beginning. Right. Yeah, exactly. He goes all the way back. <coughs> got to skip over the whole birth thing. Uh, so he also doesn't have a birth narrative. Uh, Luke does have a birth narrative. <coughs> Luke and Matthew are the two that, that uh, we refer to this time of year. Um, but Luke doesn't begin with Jesus' birth. He begins with whose birth? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Uh, and, and the difficulties his parents had with, with producing a kid. Um, and so Matthew is unique in, in starting with Jesus' genealogy. Um, why, why does he open with the genealogy? When did it add to the stature of Christ the Messiah to come from David? <clears throat> King. Okay. So, so it is important, uh, and we'll talk about this a bit more, uh, about 
the fact that he is descended from David, who was, uh, you know, the, the greatest king in, in Israel's history. Um, but there are a lot more names here than just David, right? Uh, what, what other reasons or what, what significance should we draw from this genealogy? Well, isn't this a prophetic fulfillment? I mean, you know, talking about God saying that he would establish David's throne forever, and this is through Jesus. Yes, and, and one of Matthew's big themes is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and types. And and, uh, and so one of the common refrain, refrains throughout Matthew is this was done or this was said in order to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet or through Isaiah. And, and then they you know, quote scripture. Um, so this this seems related to that. We are, we are pulling on the Old Testament history and, and kind of situating ourselves within it. What's the significance that Matthew draws at the end of the genealogy? That there were equal amounts of time between these events. The returns from Abraham to David, David to the deportation of them, they're all 14 generations. Yeah, they're all 14 generations, which makes me say, wow, that's pretty neat, the way God kind of constructed history. Um, and 14, of course, is a significant number because it's twice seven. Seven is the number of perfection, and, and right? Um, <laughs> but are there actually 14 generations between each of these things listed here? Not quite. If you flip over on the back, you can see them numbered in 14s. Uh, and what do you notice? Yeah, we're a little short. There are only 13 in the last section. He was a tax collector. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So been basically <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Um, and, and you might say, well, okay, maybe we should shift Jacob and I over to, to the other one too, since he's kind of mentioned the end of one again. But you don't do that with David, because if you do that with David, then you end up with too many in the middle, right? <clears throat> so this is a little curious. The counting seems to be off. Um, it, it's also interesting, <clears throat> if you look at the middle section, these are the kings. Right, these are all kings in uh, Jesus' lineage, uh, starting with David over 14. But, but then, uh, you know, the kings go up to Jeconiah, and then you have the deportation to Babylon when Babylon came in and, and destroyed Jerusalem. Um, so this middle section are the kings. But look at the list that First Chronicles uh, gives us. Uh, and this goes back to your question earlier about, you know, what other supporting evidence do we have for this? Um, well, the best supporting evidence we have is from the Old Testament, where they, you know, chronicle their kings. Uh, and, and so this is 1 Chronicles 3, 10 to 14. And as I read it, kind of follow along the list that you have above there. Now, Solomon's son was Rabboam, okay, 15 to 16. Abijah was his son, looking good. Asa, his son. Jehoshaphat, his son. Joram, his son. All right, we're up to 20. Ahazi, uh, Ahaz, Ahaziah, his son. Joash, his son, Amaziah, his son, Azariah, his son, Jotham, his son, Ahaz, his son, Hezekiah, his son, Manasseh, his son, Ammon, his son, Josiah, his son. What did you notice? There are a few more names there than are listed in Matthew's account. So, so how do we get 14 generations in the middle? by kind of culling a few and not mentioning them. So it's not just that we're a little short at the end, we also get 14 in the middle by not mentioning a few generations. Uh, and, and most would say that Azariah is probably Uzziah, just a different name. Uh, but even if you do that, you still have three generations that are not mentioned. <clears throat> Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah. <clears throat> So what do we do with that? I don't know. That's that's the, the general thing. But, but I would say this is part of a pattern in Matthew. 
there is often in Matthew, uh, you know, as we mentioned, uh, fulfillment of prophecy in Old Testament things tent is a major theme of Matthew. And most of those, you look at them and you think, oh, wow, well, that's really cool the way God fulfilled that. But then if you go back and look at the Old Testament passage that's supposedly being fulfilled, you know, what in the world is he talking about? Right? And, and so, you know, it's like, again, Matthew's cooked the books to make these prophecies work. Uh, but then if you go back and, and wrestle with it a bit more, eventually you come to realize, oh, wait, he's actually making a very different point. It's not what I thought it was. Right? Probably the, the preeminent example of this occurs in the next chapter. Chapter 2, a, a passage I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, actually, yeah. End of chapter 1. Um Verses 22 to 23. Now all this took place that what was spoken by the Lord through his prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Right? Now that's in reference to what? Jesus. Uh, and, and he's quoting Isaiah 7, 14. Right? And so this is showing that that. Jesus' birth is somehow a fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. And, and what's the aspect of fulfillment? Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So God with us can't be with us, too. Yes, that's actually the point he's making. But what most of us in the church tend to focus on is which part of that verse. <clears throat> Yeah, that she's a virgin. Yeah. Right? And that's the big miracle, right? Um, <clears throat> she did not know a man in that way, and yet, guess what? She was able to give birth. And, you know, we, we have Christmas plays like, oh, you know, those Jews are so hard-hearted, they don't even, uh, you know, read their own scriptures. And scripture predicted that, you know, the Messiah was going to be born. No, it doesn't. If you go back and read Isaiah 7, this is, uh, Isaiah is speaking this to King Ahaz, you know, one of the kings in this list. Uh, and he's telling him, this is a sign for Ahaz that he doesn't have to worry about these two nations, Israel and, and um, uh, Aram, that are wanting to come take over Judah. Uh, and he says, you don't have to worry about that. And as a sign, uh, a young woman is going to give birth and call his son Emmanuel. So this is a sign for Ahaz that has to take place within Ahaz's lifetime for this to make any sense at all. It's not a prediction of some Messiah that's going to be born centuries later. And in fact, it's not talking about a virgin at all. It's talking about a young woman. Because again, it had to have been fulfilled in Ahaz's day, which means if it were talking about a virgin, then <clears throat> we would have two virgin births, which I don't think most of us want to go there. Um, <laughs> so, you know, is again, Matthew kind of twisting the scriptures to make it fit. I don't think so. But what he is doing is he's setting you up to um, take a superficial reading that turns out on deeper investigation not to be the case, which means you then have to wrestle with it. And, and so what is he saying with this fulfillment passage? Well, I think you're right. The, the fulfillment, as he highlights, is the fact that Jesus is the ultimate instantiation of God with us. That's the fulfillment. It has nothing to do with Mary being a virgin. Does that make sense? So I would think he's probably doing a similar thing with this genealogy. Setting it up so you first read through and think, wow, that's really cool the way God has structured everything. And then you do a little bit digger, deeper digging and you realize, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense at all. Which then encourages you to, to kind of wrestle with it. Well, what's actually going on with this genealogy? Okay. <clears throat> by the way, every single one of his, uh, you know, this was in order to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Every single one has an issue. And it's a different issue in pretty much every case. Sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, twisting a word so it means something it didn't mean back then. Sometimes it's uh, quoting the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew, the Greek instead of the Hebrew, and the Hebrew is very different. Um, 
Sometimes you look at it and you're like, well, how in the world is this a fulfillment of that? It doesn't seem to correspond at all. Um, so I would encourage you as you read through Matthew and you see one of these fulfillment citations, actually go back and read the context and, and you know, think about how is this actually a fulfillment? Because the, the superficial uh, agreement that we often see at first is usually not what's going on at all. Okay. Um, another curious thing about this genealogy is that it's very different from the one given in Luke. So Luke also, uh, he doesn't start with the genealogy, but he does get there in chapter three. <clears throat> um, it's quoted there on the uh, back of your passage. I'm not going to read through um, Luke's, but he has a lot more names. In fact, from, uh, well, and Luke actually takes it all the way back to Adam and even God, right? Where does Matthew start his genealogy? With Abraham, right? Now, what's the significance of starting a genealogy with Abraham? Because he was the first Jew ever got in chase. Right. So, so Matthew is saying what by starting his genealogy with Abraham? He's putting Jesus in a very Jewish context, right? Uh, Luke, on the other hand, takes it back to Adam. And again, you know, Adam is the son of God, so he ultimately takes it back to God. Um, what kind of context does that put Jesus in? Divine or, or kind of a universal, right? He, he takes it all the way back to Adam, like, you know, so he's putting him in, in kind of all humanity context, as opposed to a specifically Jewish context, right? Um, if you read through the names, uh, they are pretty much the same up until David. And, and Luke actually goes um, backwards instead of Matthew's counting forwards. But from David um, back to Abraham, uh, Luke has one more name. He sticks in Admin um, in between Ram and Aminadab. <clears throat> but from David on, it's completely different with a couple exceptions. Um, you still get Zerubbabel, who's the son of, son of Shealtiel, which were the two that started Matthew's third. And you get Joseph. Other than that, it's completely different. So what do we do with that? Um, and, and for Luke, from Abraham to Joseph is 56 generations. Right? It'd be 57 if you include Jesus. Um, though he also has this kind of parallel generation thing. So from Shealtiel to Joseph, that is the, you know, corresponds to Matthew's third set of 14, there are 21 generations. From David to, to Neri, who's the father of Shealtiel in this account, 21 generations. And from Adam to Abraham, 21 generations. Uh, and then you got 13 or so from Abraham to David. And all told, if you go from Adam to Jesus, you end up with 77 generations. Once again, a very nice number, seven times 11. Um, <clears throat> you you got to get the nice numbers. <clears throat> so what do we do with this? The, the, you know, the, the names are completely different. Well, the, the usual way of accounting for this is to suggest that um, Matthew is giving you Joseph's genealogy. And Luke is giving you Mary's genealogy, which is possible. Uh, Matthew is very focused on Joseph and his story. Uh, who is Joseph's father in Matthew's genealogy? Jacob. Do you know of any other Josephs whose father was Jacob? What's that Joseph known for? Being Jacob started the nation. That Jacob started the nation, right? He became Israel. Um, but what is that Joseph known for? He went to Egypt. He did. And, and why is he able to do all that? God planned it that way. Uh, and how does God tend to speak to that Joseph? Dreams. 
dreams, right? That's his big thing. He's able to, he gets dreams of, you know, all his weak brothers bowing down to him, the moon and stars. And, <clears throat> and then Pharaoh has dreams and he's able to interpret them because he interpreted the, the you know, cup holder and the baker's dreams. And um, well, guess what? This Joseph is going to have several of dreams, right? He has dreams in which the angel comes and says, hey, I know your fiance is getting a little round. It's okay. You don't have to divorce her. She's been faithful to you. This is God's doing. Uh, and you know, you have a dream like that. You go with it. Um, <laughs> then, then he has another dream saying, you know, people are going to come try to kill your kid. You need to immediately get out. And so they go to Egypt. And um, then he has another dream that says, okay, the people who are looking for your, your son to kill your son, they're dead now. You can go back. And so they do. Um, so, so again, there, there are a lot of kind of fulfillment of Old Testament types going on here um, with the way Joseph uh, is treated. But Matthew focuses on Joseph. Uh, Luke, as we're probably familiar with, focuses on Mary, right? The angel comes and speaks to Mary, and she's like, oh, you know, who am I? But, you know, let it be as, as God has said. Um, so it, it would make sense that, uh, you know, Luke is giving us Mary's genealogy and, and Matthew is giving us Joseph's. Um, you still have the issue of there being a lot more generations uh, in Luke's version, and you know, even just from, from Abraham to Joseph. Uh, 56 as opposed to 42. That's a lot of new generations to kind of fit in. Um, but I think what it does show is, is that Matthew's genealogy is selected at, at best. Um, you know, even if you go back to First Chronicles, you can see he's kind of cut some people out. Um, so that would suggest that he's trying to do something else with this genealogy. <clears throat> do you notice anything else odd about Matthew's genealogy? Who do genealogies tend to focus on? Males, right? And, and both Luke and Matthew do that as well. Uh, but Matthew also throws in a few other people, right? Mm -hmm. who, who else gets mentioned? Mm -hmm. Rahab, mm -hmm. Yeah, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Uriah's wife, uh, and of course, Mary. Now, of course, you have to mention Mary because she's the one that you know, is actually the mother of Jesus, and, and if Joseph isn't really, uh, you know, contributing uh, to that part of the, the story, then you've got to kind of mention Mary. Uh, but we also have four other women that are mentioned. And the question then becomes, well, why have we highlighted these four women? What is it about these women that, that merits their inclusion in this genealogy? Uh, because, you know, normally it's, it's simply you follow the fathers. Okay, they all have direct experiences with God. They're all mentioned in Scripture. Um, but that would be true of a lot of women in this line. Uh, so what is it about these four? What do we know about these four? What, what is Tamar's story? Judah's wife. Or, well, she was, she was the wife of Judah's son, Er. Uh, but Ur did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and so the Lord struck him dead. Uh, well, what happens when your brother dies and leaves a widow with no children? Then, yeah, then, then the brother is supposed to go and, and um, you know, raise up children to carry on his brother's family. So Judah gives Tamar to Onan, that was his second son, and said, here, you know, uh, impregnate your... your um, sister-in-law, and uh, he doesn't want to do it because uh, that will build up his brother's family, not his. He wants to you know, build up his family. Um, so, so he doesn't do it, and, and God ends up striking him dead. And at this point, Judah's like, this, this girl's bad luck. I, I don't want to give her to my third and, and only son that's <clears throat> left. So he tells her, uh, you know, okay, why don't you go back to your father's house and, and live your widowhood out there? And then when, when uh, you know, my third son is old enough, 
then I'll give him to you. But he, he's still too young to, to really fulfill this duty. She says, okay. So she goes home and, and then, you know, years pass. And she eventually hears, oh, you know, his son has grown and he's still not giving him to me. Right? Because he didn't want his son to die. So what does she do? Uh, yeah, yeah. She hears that he's going out to, to some place, so she goes by the side of the road and sets up her tent and, and dresses up like a temple prostitute. And Judah comes by and says, "Oh, well, this is convenient." Um, so, so he goes in and, and uh, says, "Well, what are you going to pay me?" He says, well, "I'll give you a sheep." So he says, "Well, how, how do I know that you're actually going to pay?" Um, he says, "Well, what, what will you want me to give you?" He says, "Well, give me your, your ring and your staff, and, and you know, she gets all of his personal belongings." Um, he impregnates her, uh, and then she slips away. And, and then when he sends his servant with the sheep, everyone's like, no, no one's here. No, there's no temple prostitute there. And then he hears that his daughter-in-law, um, is pregnant, which means she must have been unfaithful. It's like, oh, we have to kill her. She has to die because she's disgracing my, my son's memory. And so they're, they're bringing her over to, to Judah's family to kill her. And, and she says, yes, my Lord, you know, the one I was unfaithful with, these are his things. Maybe you know whose they are. <laughs> uh, and he sees them and, and he's like, oh, wow, she is more righteous than I am because I wasn't giving her my son to, to raise up. She's like, okay, she's, she's good. Um, and she, she ends up having twins. Um, what about Rahab? What's her story? She was the, the prostitute that hid the spots. Yeah, yeah. She was in Jericho. Mm -hmm. And remember, the, the uh, Israelites were coming across, entering into the promised land, uh, getting ready to, to take the land that God had promised them after they had wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. The spies go in and, uh, you know, her place is a place that you can kind of get into easily and, and hide out. And, um, when the uh, government officials come to find out where they are, she sends them off on a wild goose chase. Uh, and then she goes to them and says, hey, look, I know that God is with you. Um, the fear of you guys has fallen on all of us. Um, please, you know, remember me when you come and, and take our city, because I know you're going to take it. And so they say, OK. And then she lets them down through the, the window in the wall. Uh, and they escape, and, and they end up saving her and her family when they take the city. Uh, so that is Rahab. What about Ruth? She spoke with Naomi and Leah. Yeah, yeah. Naomi and her husband, because of a famine, had to go to Moab. Uh, and and there, uh, one of her sons <clears throat> marries Ruth. Um, disaster falls on his family. All the sons and, and uh, father die. Uh, Naomi decides to go back to Israel, and Ruth says, I'm going with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She goes back. Um, Boaz is, is her um, kinsman, redeemer. kinsman redeemer, yes, uh, for, for her uh, because of her deceased husband. So she goes to visit him uh, on the threshing floor one night and, and explain that he's her kinsman's redeemer. And um, he says, oh, yes, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, but there's someone who's a closer kinsman redeemer. He has to, you know, refuse his claim first if, if we're going to do this. Um, he does. And so Boaz is able to marry Ruth. Um, they end up with Obed, uh, who gives birth to Jesse, and then David. Uh, and then, of course, uh, David refers to the wife of uh, Uriah, which, who was that? Bathsheba. Bathsheba, right? Whom David was supposed to be at war, but he's on his roof and sees her bathing and says, take a Bathsheba. Yeah. <laughs> so he calls her over and, and has his way and then has Uriah killed and um, all in all a bad situation. But, but it does result in Solomon um, eventually. Uh, the, the initial child from that encounter dies, but uh, eventually, uh, you know, they, he takes her as wife and, and produces Solomon, um, and it goes on. So what is it about these four women, uh, and then, of course, you have Mary, that would merit their inclusion in this genealogy? Uh, well, some have suggested that all of them have um, kind of some kind of sexual issue. 
uh, there, there's some kind of sexual impropriety or, or uh, thing that happens. So Mary obviously is unmarried yet pregnant. Um, Tamar, of course, uh, disguised herself as a prostitute in order to uh, seduce her father-in-law. Uh, Rahab was a prostitute. Uh, Ruth, what does Ruth do? Well, some have suggested that uh, when she goes to the threshing floor, it uncovers his feet. That's a euphemism. Um, and Uriah's wife, uh, obviously, you know, there was that whole situation. Um, I'm not sure that really works. Uh, and again, why, why would that merit inclusion in this? Um, is there something else that these four women all have in common? What nationality are they? Ruth was a Moabitess. Ruth was from Moab. She was a Moabitess. Bathsheba. We don't know what she was, but what was her husband? Uriah. Uriah the Hittite. He was a Hittite. And, and that's how she's referred to, you know, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, uh, which, which kind of emphasizes the fact that, that she was likely a Hittite as well. Probably. Um, Rahab? Well, she was a citizen of Jericho. She wasn't an Israelite. Uh, and Tamar? Well, Judah had gone off to marry a Canaanite woman, and so he was living among the Canaanites. She's probably Canaanite, not Jewish. So all four of these women are Gentile. Why does Matthew include them? I think he includes them to show that this was never just about the Jews. This is yeah, Gentiles were, were always uh, intended to be included. Um, now, Matthew, again, we say he starts with Abraham, right? That situates Jesus in a very um, uh, Jewish context. And his gospel is extremely Jewish, uh, with lots of quotations from the Old Testament, awareness of Jewish practices, and um, and, and, and in uh, Matthew's gospel, you know, Gentiles ask Jesus to heal them. What does he say? I was sent only to the house of Israel. It's not until the very end of the gospel where he gets authority over the nations, over the Gentiles, right? But that's not a surprise development. It's always been part of the plan. Gentiles have been worked into this story from the very beginning, right? Even going back to the <clears throat> patriarchs in Judah. So this is, again, a common pattern in Matthew where he sets something up. You think, oh, he's setting this up to be this is the Jewish story. But actually, no, there are some twists in there that, that Gentiles are part of this story, too. And the Messiah is not just a Jewish Messiah. He's also got Gentile blood. In him. Right? Does that make sense? Um, okay. One other thing I, I want to highlight here. Starts off the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why do we highlight those two? David and Abraham. They're sort of like the founding authors of the sheep. I mean, yeah, cover the of the page of Patriarch. The original Jews. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so the original covenant is with Abraham, and that right. starts kind of the, the Jewish people. Um, though you could argue Judah is also a you know, significant patriarch. Yeah. Uh, his his son, or son of Jacob. And um, <clears throat> What is it about this covenant? Who is the covenant made with, with Abraham? Wow. Yeah. yeah, and God makes it with Abraham and his seed his seed right and if you read the Galatians uh, you know, there's a big discussion about how no, there's one seed and uh, that seed turns it out to be seed. it doesn't say seeds but it says seed there's one seed what about David why do we highlight David because God promised that uh, David was faithful he established his throne forever yeah yeah 2 Samuel 7 12 to 17 um, this is what God says to David through Nathan, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you, 
who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So he highlights um, Abraham and David because they were each given promises as a result of their faith and, and faithfulness that have implications for their offspring. Right? And, and specifically one that God was going to raise up. You could even argue that the reason uh, Jesus is able to survive the curse of the law on the cross is because of the promise that was given to Abraham. Right? Uh, that he would bless all the nations, all the Gentiles through his seed. Um, David, too, that, you know, you would have an eternal throne. Right? So, um, as you think about genealogies, your faithfulness secures blessing not just for you, but for those who come after you. What kind of legacy are you leaving for your descendants? What promises has God given you uh, that extend beyond yourself? Right? Your, your faith saves you. It's your faithfulness that secures blessing for others. That's why we, we seek to be faithful. All right. All right. Well, we will close there with that thought. Um, and think, too, about your past ancestors and their faithfulness and how that has affected you um, in, in establishing you and enabling you to grow in your faith. All right. Merry Christmas. Have a good week. Merry Christmas. Thank you.